electric vehicle market and battery materials. This is a hot topic with this particular group. This is, we are the battery material sector. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start to my right with Greg Bose. And Greg, I'd love for you to take one minute to introduce us, but introduce yourself to our investors on why your market valuation is gonna go a lot higher, okay? I only have one minute. Yeah, one minute. This is the elevator pitch. A minute, a minute? Yeah, you got one minute. You can do it for a minute, a minute and a half. Uh, very simply, uh, lithium, cobalt, graphite are very small markets. The um, automobile markets are very large. And even if we only get a small degree of penetration into those markets, a couple percent of new vehicles every year, that requires multiple new uh, graphite mines, cobalt mines, and lithium mines. So nothing is, uh, nothing is certain in the investment business, but uh, that's a pretty good bet. And Brent, your stock's up from Nexource is up about uh, 10, 11 percent today. Uh, what's going on here? Well, um, that's a great question. I, uh, I mean, we've been very much flying under the radar. I mean, uh, we do have an updated feasibility study that's coming out next week, but it's all based, if you saw my presentation yesterday, we are doing what's called a phased modular approach. And this is a, a first, we believe, for the industrial minerals, but really for the mining. And it's a proof of concept. As I said yesterday, that right now, uh, there certainly has to be uh, more graphite mines coming online, but as we illustrated, most of the economics out there don't work in today's prices. So what we're trying to do is scale back, do it in a phased approach, uh, come out with the right sized mine, which is smaller, but still the third largest mine in the world, but build it incrementally in a modular approach as I expressed, we can build that for $20 million. Our original CapEx was almost $200 million for roughly 50% more product. So this is quite dramatic, and if we get this thing done right, the customers we're selling the product to, we're in there. It, it is a uh, first uh, to the post. Uh, only two or three projects are gonna make it, uh, and that's assuming today's economics, and of course, if things change with the electric vehicles, then a lot of projects will come online, but we, we have to be first. And this allows us to do that. And of course, William here from Lithium X. You're, Tim, you're, Tim. I'm sorry, Tim. 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 W William is in Argentina uh, right now working. Okay. Well, forgive me. This this uh, company, as you know, I know most everybody here is new to me. So go ahead, Tim. Um, we are, as I said yesterday, we're a brine-based producer of lithium, focused right now on a project in Argentina in the south of Los Angeles. We expect soon to be building an initial ponding system that maybe in a year and a half will produce uh, 2,500 tons of saleable uh, high purity lithium brine. And if we can do it, I suspect our stock will go up because we'll have revenue and profits. <laughs> so I think that's, that's uh, probably the best bet for us. And um, of course we have Carlos from Neo Lithium. Carlos. Oh, hello everybody. Uh, so we have what we call the next significant uh, discovery in Argentina. Uh, we discovered a property called Tres Quebradas, which we call it 3Q, uh, in the province of Catamarca. This, uh, this project is uh, unique in several aspects. One of them is has very high grade. In fact, it has one of the highest grades in Argentina and in the world, top five. And has uh, one of the other important factors of brine is uh, obviously critical impurities, and we have the lowest combined critical impurities of any known solar. So those two are very important. Uh, but um, you know, we we also have uh, built and invested over nine million dollars within the project as of today. We have a camp, we have a full road, and we have all the infrastructure uh, to start um, the um, the pre-development stage. We have a resource shortly in the next. A uh, month or so or less, which is obviously a big catalyst, and then the PA uh, um, Q3 in 2017, so another three or four months of that. So I don't know if you noticed how we've uh, managed this panel, but we have lithium on one side and we have graphite on the other. So let's talk about misconceptions in battery materials. So for instance, there's quite a significant amount of batter, uh, graphite in batteries. Greg, you want to talk, talk about this for just a minute? Um, sure. Um, I'll start with the, with kind of at the uh, at the top level. Um, when you look at the graphite market, uh, let's say for the sake of argument, it's six hundred thousand tons a year. Um, 
Not all of that is battery grade material. There's a lot of variation in that. Um, the larger flake sizes won't be used in batteries because you can make more money in other markets. And a lot of the smaller stuff, either the uh, yield is not high enough or it's too difficult to uh, purify. That is also true at the level of the individual mine. So the amount of, um, of uh, battery grade material in a mine is a lot smaller than the uh, nameplate capacity. The significance of that is if, for example, a 50,000 ton a year mine comes on stream and only 20,000 of it is, let's call it, battery grade material, and when you turn that into anode material, the yield is 40 to 50 percent, so you're only producing 10,000 tons of anode material from a 50,000 ton a year mine, there's a leverage effect there. You need a lot of mines in order to get enough anode material to meet even very conservative uh, forecasts of um, future growth in lithium ion batteries. And Carlos, I know you for reputation. I'd love for you to talk to us about uh, lithium uh, needs and batteries. And uh, Paul, can I get you to move all the uh, dirty glasses off the table for me, please? Well, the good thing is that um, for all the batteries that are in you know, discussion today, every single one will need lithium, <laughs> which is uh, one of the good things about the lithium industry. But you know, another thing that people don't understand quite well is that not everything is vehicles. Um, there's a lot of other um, buses and, and motorbikes, specifically in China, where there's about 200 million of them that are going to uh, transfer into lithium. is an extremely important market. Um, so our view is that we don't want to bet on any specific type of technology. We don't need to, being a lithium provider. Our, our main objective is to provide high-grade lithium carbonate um, and not play also the game of between carbon and hydroxide because there's other players in the market can do it better than us. So our view is to keep it simple um, and let the industry essentially go where it needs to go, which we believe will be obviously in the, in the lithium side. So, um, there's plenty of, of market within the uh, battery sector for lithium. Uh, obviously, the, the one will succeed or others. Uh, we don't know which one will be the next, uh, let's say, killer uh, battery. Uh, but uh, depending on uh, who uses it, for example, in the buses in China, there's, there's certain types of batteries that are used that are more safe, that don't, don't, get, um, don't have the higher, um, call it, um, um, temperature and, and could potentially explode or burn. Uh, certain types of batteries are better than others for long distances and so forth, but at the end of the day, lithium will, will be the, you know, at least what we believe, and I'm sure that you'll say the same thing, is will be the, the, um, the winner. And Christopher Ecclestone, I'm gonna throw you up on the panel here. You're gonna step in for Chris Reed, please. I knew uh, this panel was missing uh, the kickoff catalyst for the conversation, and. Christopher, I'm going to put you right on the spot, and I'm going to ask you about the electric vehicle demand, because as we both know, Chris Reed has been a prolific speaker on the EV demand actually being very conservative, and uh, we're not asking people. I think he does a story, actually, about uh, uh, they ask the wrong question. What is it that they, they don't ask what is it that people want instead of what is it that people need, and if they did, the EV numbers would be through the roof. So I'd like you to comment on that. Yeah, um, a lot more people would have EVs if they could afford them in the West. China is setting itself out now to produce EVs that are going to be cheap, as well as a replacement for um, for the for the com normal combustion engine in in China because of its pollution problems, because of its dependency on foreign oil, which a few people mention, but that makes China potentially vulnerable in the long term. So there, there's a double sort of reason for China to do that. Um, in the West, um, we, we've seen fluctuating fortunes for electronic vehicles, when, uh, well, electric vehicles. When the price of oil got to over 100, there was a, quite a strong motivation for people to um, cut back um, and cut back on their, their petrol purchases and move over to um, electronic, that, electric, and that's not happening at the moment. Um, that motivation's not there. And of course, Tim, you, like I said, you're relatively new, uh, and you're, you've been brought on Lithium X to get them to the next level, correct? Well, I hope so, yes. Okay, so you would be an excellent person then to talk to about uh, uh, the predictions for the growth of electric vehicles coming from more of an American standpoint. Can you comment on this? Well, um, I think first of all, I agree with what has been said 
today and by people yesterday that China is going to drive the market. I can tell you, having spent much of the past 10 years talking to institutional investors in the States particularly because I was with an American company, um, their belief was that China is going to drive the market for all the obvious reasons. Uh, I think that you know, part of the problem with the electric car in the United States is, as pointed out yesterday, range anxiety. So far, uh, you know, a Tesla is a great car, but even with 250 miles of range, it limits you in a lot of places. It's okay in Washington, okay in the New York area, still even, but if you have a summer home, you know, in the Hamptons, you may be stuck uh, trying to get out there and find a place where you can charge it, assuming you don't have your own charger, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, again, I, I, I do think though that, that when Tesla or others produce, I, mean, if te I, I wouldn't bet against them. If they have a $40,000 car, I think a lot more people are going to be buying it and using it as a second vehicle. Uh, again, most Americans have, and, nor and North Americans, Canadians have two cars. Uh, so uh, the, the other thing is, which I think the, the United States really needs to think about, and I tried to work on this in government relations at my last job, is an energy policy that promotes the use of electric technology for the reason that was just mentioned before, that really it, it, it limits your, uh, it, it makes you less dependent on foreign oil. Even though, I mean, obviously we have a lot of oil in the United States, but still, ultimately, the more oil we consume, the, you know, the more clout the uh, people who don't like us have. So that's, that's kind of our very conventional view, I think. Well, I'm going to come back to you about that, but I want to go to Carlos. Everybody here in this room knows uh, Constantine Karanopoulos, and uh, we know you have some big heavyweights in neolithium. So what we'd like to know is where your target audience is for neolithium. In terms of investments? Off-take agreements <clears throat> and users. Um, well, off-take agreements, we've been to China about six times over the last six months. We've been to Europe about, mm, about four, four or five times. And uh, you know, we're not uh, looking for anyone specific. Uh, we're going to get the best deal possible, be that China or be that Europe. Um, th what we want to do is specifically as, as a as a lithium developer or exploration company uh, coming online is to associate ourselves with a group that will help us through uh, the feasibility. And, and to give you an idea, we don't want to build a feasibility study in a vacuum. As soon as we have the PA, which we should be in Q3, we want to make sure that we have a strategic or a group of strategics or you know somebody with us that will help us build whatever we need to build um, correctly. So the specifications have to be correct. The amount that we're going to produce has to be correct, so we can essentially size up uh, our production accordingly. So um, we definitely are talking to the Chinese, we're definitely talking to the Koreans and Japanese, and we're also talking to the Europeans. Um, now, I think everybody's saying that China's going to be number one. I agree. They're the ones that ask the better questions, they're the ones that are more aggressive, they're the ones that want to pay more, at least today. That doesn't mean that the Europeans are um, not looking at that. In fact, you know, we just came back to talk to uh, one, of the, one of the largest car manufacturer in Europe, and they're very aggressive. Now, um, they are, am I going to say they're going to go into mining? No, uh, but they're looking at, you know, if you want to have, if you're the largest car producer with 10 million, and you want to go to 13 million, you want to have 3 million cars, you have to be aggressive trying to find uh, your supply in order to meet those. So they've been very public. And we're happy to help them do that, if that may be. So obviously, Constantine uh, and also others in our board uh, have been very important uh, to open those doors. And the conversations that we had have been uh, extremely well received. Well, I can't tell you. I still recall uh, sitting down with Constantine and him giving me a speech about it's who you know for uh, end users if you're going to survive. And he was one of the only CEOs in the industry that, of course, uh, had revenue in 2000 <laughs> with Neo Materials. So now, of course, I'm going to go to next source here. Where's your target audience? Are you looking at the Chinese market as well, uh, Brent? And what is your forecast on the EV market? Oh, uh, OK. Uh, two big questions. So two no, we're, questions. we're not looking to China. Uh, so we've now been established uh, with two significant firms, non-Chinese, very large. And I think they represent probably 50% of the buying power 
of flake graphite. We've had uh, negotiations at the highest levels now for over three years. So what is happening now is with our, our phased approach and getting that first 15,000 tonnes, which effectively is spoken for, uh, the two particular parties we're talking to uh, have, have the abilities to go to all the demand markets. So they are very, very heavy in the refractories, also in the electric vehicle market, as well as the foils. So those two particular customers have been staying with us and all they're waiting for is for us to get into production. And that's what triggers the offtakes. In graphite, you've probably read out there all these so-called uh, offtakes. No one really has a true offtake. And the reason for that, and I want to state, state on the record, at least for energy, uh, next source, is that they're waiting for someone to actually get into production. And at that point, they'll notify their current suppliers and say, okay, we're now switching. No one's gonna be depending 100% on one source. They'll be buying from three or four, but to actually go in ahead of time and, and change suppliers, unless they know you're up and running, does not happen. So we hope right now, when we get ourselves up and running in the next uh, couple of months, we'll be able to show the market that here, we do have offtakes and you guys will recognize those names. And I think they'll add a lot of credence to where we need to go. In terms of electric vehicle market, I truly believe it's coming. Again, I was very clear yesterday that I believe that could be five years away. If you're a mine that's going to open up in the next year or two, your markets will be the traditional markets, at least for the graphite side. That's 65% going to refractories and consumer electronics for foils. So you need to be able to sell that product. Our plan is to sell that in about nine months time. It is not to the electric vehicle market. Absolutely, we'll be planning on doing that and building that into our value add uh, but right now, our project is economical, selling to the traditional markets, which is $1,000 a ton. Okay, I'm going to put, did everyone just bear with me, we're going somewhere here, and Christopher, coming back to your cheat sheet notes that you have here, okay, we're going to, but what I want to do is put Adrian Griffin on the spot here, because he's done magnificent work with negotiating with the Chinese, and I'd like you to comment on the electric vehicle market and, and battery materials. I think Christopher made uh, a pretty pertinent comment, and if you look at the year-on-year -year expansion of the EV market uh, in the Western world, it's actually been a contraction over the last 12 months, uh, and that's been driven by cheaper fuel. So we're not seeing what people uh, have predicted for a long period of time. Now, that's, that's going to change, of course. There'll be a balance between uh, fuel pricing and the attractive uh, pricing of, of EVs, and I think Longer term, we're going to see a technology change there too, which will get rid of the range anxiety. I was mentioning some of that yesterday, and I think that will uh, revolve around um, changes in, in battery technology, battery chemistry, which might even see cobalt disappear from many of the batteries. So that, that, that's where I see the, the EV market in the Western world. It's going to change, there's no doubt about that, and with uh, legislative changes, particularly in uh, Europe and Scandinavia, um, we will start to see a bit of a catch-up regardless of fuel, fuel price, I guess. Uh, the Chinese market, the first time I went to, to China, which is many years ago now, everyone used to pedal push bikes. You go there now and no one moves their legs when they get on a push bike. It's just uh, battery-powered bike after battery-powered bike. Now, I think that's, that's the advantage of having a communist regime to some extent, that uh, they are providing incentives, but to a large extent they're simply told what they've got to do. So if you've got that sort of regime, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that EVs are going to proliferate. They are going to uh, save a lot of problems. Um, with okay, respect Adrian. to- Adrian, sorry. Okay, team, dream team, I need short answers here. We gotta have a bit of a debate. <clears throat> if all of you give three to five an minute answers, we're all gonna go into a coma, all right? So yes or no, do we have conservative uh, electric vehicle forecast? And do you think that we're gonna have, you know, more, uh, what do you call, algorithmic uh, growth here in demand for EVs out of China? Because you go there all the time. Oh, China, there's no doubt. There's gonna be uh, uh, expanding growth in China. So the but answer I, I, is yes. Right? Fabulous. Let me think on that. <laughs> I can feel Carlos. No, you hold the microphone because you're going to handle the audience for me. I can feel Carlos has an opinion on this. And then Carlos, I'd like you to take it um, on, I'd like you to comment on your view of the Elon Musk model for vehicles. Um, 
I, I, yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, you can see any research. Research say just six months ago, 4% of the entire car fleet was going to be EV, and all of a sudden they doubled it to 8%. <laughs> so what happened in six months? I don't know, a couple announcements from Volkswagen, uh, Elon, uh, Musk, and the others. So yes, I think it's conservative. The problem is that what's the price? Uh, what's the price of all the lithium? Uh, and there's just not going to be enough of it to, uh, in my opinion, to, to meet all these demands. So, and that includes, you know, when we talk about uh, Elon and uh, Tesla, I, my view is that he's great for the, for the industry. I love him because he promotes all of us, and that's, that's great, but he's not going to be the winner here. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of other companies that are going to just smooth right in and take even a better approach than he has, including the Chinese, including Volkswagen, including all the others. So I believe that their cars, for example, their batteries, um, the way I understand their batteries and the cars, they're, they're very, they're, it's, it's an old, um, how can I say this? The way the batteries are connected, there are many places where these batteries can essentially overheat and potentially catch fire. Now, all, all these points that are, are within the battery, I, I believe that at some point we will see you know, uh, risk associated with that. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it could happen. And there's other um, uh, potential types of cars and battery uh, or BMSs that are much better off, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, than Tesla. Now, Tesla obviously, of course, has the big name and you know the promotion behind it, but I don't really believe it. Maybe I'm the bad guy in the room here, but I don't believe that Elon's going to be the, the winner at the end of the day. They're going to move out. Tesla's not going to be a car manufacturer. Right, right, you know, one of the comments I would make, I mean, Tesla is a halo brand. So Tesla, everybody sees it. It's a high, high quality car. Conservative reports ranked at number one. We look at that, and as an average consumer, that is what gives you the, the confidence that the new bioelectric vehicle is going to work. I came back from China two months ago, met with one of the largest producers of battery EVs, and they said the following to us. We have failed in the internal combustion engine. We will not fail in the electric vehicle. China sold more electric vehicles last quarter than Tesla sold globally all year. So when they, again, I told you guys about 500,000 vehicles will double the graphite space. 500,000 vehicles, period. So Tesla has plans for 500, Volvo has plans for a million, Bolt for Chevy has the same, you have Nissan at 8 million. These ones are significant. So again, the proliferation of electric vehicles, I'll put it this way, they either work or they don't. You're not going to see a 1% or 10% penetration. It's either going to be 50% penetration in 10, 20 years, or it's going to be a failure. I don't think anyone in this room believes that electric vehicles are going to fail at this stage. I would uh, put a slightly more conservative spin on it, but uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, lithium companies calculated that if you add up the targets of all of the governments worldwide, it comes to 17.5 million electric vehicles on the road by 2020. So these are all of their announced targets. And I would just suggest, uh, well, there's an old Chinese proverb, he who forecasts had best forecast often. And, uh, you know, I don't think we'll get there, but I think the most powerful message is if we get 10 or 20% there, you should buy lithium, cobalt, and graphite. I, if I could just add, um, I, uh, you know, I would be, conservative about growth in the United States short term, near to medium term. And, and really, since I've been in the lithium business, our projections to the investment community have always been very conservative. Having said that, there is still enough demand, as was just said, for all of the products needed for batteries that it's still worthwhile to develop new lithium sources. We're, we're certainly a believer in that. So I think there's going to be plenty of demand for lithium. Uh, you know, regardless of whether it's, you know, uh, it takes us two years, five years, six years to start to, start to see a significant amount of electric vehicles on, uh, on the road in the States or in North America. I also do think that Europe is going to be a big driver because of the regulatory climate there. It is, uh, in addition to uh, gasoline being, you know, more expensive, more heavily taxed, uh, it, uh, the, the governments in Germany, France, etc., are pushing more towards, you know, more efficient vehicles, use of electric technology. And the other thing that uh, is important over there is the university system is encouraged by Germany to work with the companies. And so I, I, I'm confident about the lithium business. 
So Christopher is going to put these battery materials in order of which one will be most in demand. I'm going to corner you. Yes, indeed. Um, so we have three metals, uh, three metals, minerals. Um, that are You're sitting at the graphite table. So yeah, I know. I, I don't know where, <laughs> which side I should be sitting at here. Um, but um, why are you feeling defensive there? Um, we have three minerals that are going into this mix here. Um, at least in the short term, as Brent has pointed out, you know, it's, it's refractories are the tail that wag that dog. It's not the batteries, uh, and it won't be for at least five years. Um, at the moment, the metal that's moving on um, the battery story is cobalt. Um, lithium had its rise last year and then stabilised. The cobalt surge is still going ahead. Cobalt is the most vulnerable to this, this issue. But you must pause to the last panel of the day to go on about that. So you've got lithium and graphite. Give us, give us the goods on lithium and graphite, because we're all investors here. We all have positions in both lithium and graphite companies. I mean, what's going on? Is, it going, is the demand going to be as intense as we, as insiders in this industry? I don't want to use the term insiders, but uh, as, as people in, this, in the technology metal sector, the graphite industry, it looks to me like that's got a surge here. We should have a bull market. Well, there are two different again. dynamics here. You've got China that's got a weak exposure to lithium, they, they hardly have any. So that's why they're mainly having to import it. China is the biggest player in graphite. So they've actually got their sort of arms around global graphite and the Western players that are gonna be added are gonna be supplying the Western market more than the Chinese market, I perceive, in the long term. But that's a great market to have because what we do have in the short term is China is going to be the vast majority of the electronic, electric vehicles. Um, I agree with the, what the other speakers have said here. Western adoption is really poor. I mean, there is a perception in North America that the Europeans are very progressive. Yeah, sure, you go to Norway. Norway has a government policy to have a lot of charging stations. Go to the UK, hardly anyone has HEVs, let alone EVs. Um, there's just not much push, and that's despite the fact that fuel prices are double what they are in, in North America. So despite higher fuel prices, Europeans have not been big adopters, and they really have to have a government gun against their head before they'll do it. And the government isn't putting the gun against the head because if it does it, and the, the diesel crisis, diesel gate is a good example. A lot of people have diesel cars in Europe. The government knows that if it wants to get them off the road, it's gonna to have to pay people money. If you want people to give up their cars that can last 10 years, um, in the next five years, you're gonna to have to pay them to give up those cars. Adrian, I feel like you have a comment here. Yes, no, or do you want to give, let me give it back to Greg Bose, who is going to talk about the difference in graphites and how the Chinese may not have as uh, impressive graphite, correct? Uh, yes. Um, the, I think the biggest announcement that came out of the graphite business last year was the Chinese government announcing that they're going to create a graphite stockpile equal to 80% of their annual production. Now, you can pretty well bet they're not going to stockpile the lower quality grades and the stuff that's over, in oversupply um, or is non-battery gr grade. So I would say that effectively means over 100% uh, stockpile for the higher quality grades. Would you do that if you thought you did not have a supply problem and you had all kinds of graphite? I would suggest you probably wouldn't. I would say that the Chinese are maybe tired of selling their natural resources cheaply to the rest of the world while incurring a huge environmental cost to do so. They don't want to sell us graphite, they want to sell us batteries, or they want to sell us electric cars and they're creating a stockpile. I won't go into the dynamics of the Chinese um, graphite production because we don't uh, have time. I would just say if you're a battery maker or a car maker outside of China, you should be very worried about that. So based on what Christopher is just saying then, stocks, for instance, like Carlos and Adrian have, lithium companies where you have relationships with the Chinese would be advantageous, correct? Oh, my, my view is uh, for lithium companies, what they've got to do is bypass China. One of the, the biggest problems the Chinese have at the moment is the impost they've got on exports if you're looking at lithium chemicals. So if you're a lithium company, the thing to do is produce a lithium chemical 
and not a concentrate and bypass China and go direct to the end user, which are going to be the North Americans, the Europeans, the Japanese and the Koreans. I can go. I'll have a comment to that. Yeah, I agree with that, but just for the sake of not agreeing too much. Um, the, um, the, the Chinese, um, the majority of them are not miners. So um, they're looking at us to provide the lithium carbonate. So they, they're saying, look, I mean, I'll give you the money, but you gotta do it. Not, I'm not, I mean, I don't know how to do it. I, I know how to do other stuff, but not that. I know how to do batteries, and I know how to do cathodes, and this and that. So you do it. Um, for us, as a, as a lithium company, obviously that puts the risk back on us. Yeah, the financing risk taken care of, but the, the, the operating risk is back on us. Now, Lithium Americas um, obviously did a different type of deal where they associated some with SQM, and now they, they found their, their part of the financing from the Chinese. That was a good deal for them, but now the risk here is that SQM is ever going to build that mine. So that's a risk, but independent of that, I think that the operational risk is, 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 um, is there um, on the SQM side. Also, the Chinese, um, um, when you say to, you know, obviously avoid them, um, when you look at the capex in China, as you know, I'm sure, uh, to build an operating plant, let's say in Argentina or Chile, wherever that may be in our world, um, it costs three, four, five times more than to build it in China. So there is uh, obviously a cost um, benefit to shareholders and to everybody to potentially partner JB or whatever that may be in China and build a plant much cheaper there uh, and you know take you know, give the money back to the shareholder instead of trying to build something more expensive. I'm not saying all of it is like that, but I'm saying a huge part of the business, uh, obviously, is important in that, in that front. So, yeah, um, that's just my, my, my view. So, Tim, you know, we're talking about the U.S. and maybe the demand for electric vehicles may not be as great because, you know, we, it's, it's a large country, okay? So what about this off the grid, on the grid, and all of these... Uh, you know, uh, the consumer that wants to have a battery and live their own life and not be uh, tapped into the uh, electrical infrastructure. Can you You're talk talking about, about storage batteries. I am talking yeah, about well, storage batteries. Yeah, well, certainly uh, Rothwood, my former employer, uh, and forgive me for talking too much about them, but they, they certainly believe that there, if we could sell good if, if the industry were to develop good lithium storage batteries, the profit opportunity would be very good there because what you need is reliability. The only uh, hesitation I have about how quickly that could grow or how big it could be is that, is that again, the, the people who use batteries are pretty conservative. And, uh, you know, the thing about a lithium battery for a vehicle is it's light. Same thing for your, your phone. A lithium battery is great, but, uh, you know, the, they... The battery industry itself is still is still leaning towards uh, uh, older technologies for storage. So I, I mean, I I don't have an answer to that personally. You know, but I, I can't say how clever it is to keep uh, referring to you know what a coup it was for uh, uh, Lithium X to get you on their team. Well, they got two other smarter guys, and then uh, and then the smarter guys said, Hey, Tim, why don't you join? So I'm sure, uh, do you have a comment I on do. battery, I mean, uh, battery storage? Yeah, just to, to give the size of the, the markets. I mean, electric vehicles are, are the, uh, it, it's out there. I mean, it's, it's the thing we can all see. You should see the forecasts for large scale energy storage. They dwarf cars. So these are batteries that sit under bunkers. For example, vanadium redox batteries, lithium batteries, sodium sulfur batteries. All these, especially the lithium ones, they just take more and more uh, of the cathode and the anodes that you'd find in a car. And the projections when I came again back from Jap Japan and China just most recently, it is mind boggling, but you don't hear about this. These things are extremely industrial. For example, in Japan, they have football fields of vanadium batteries sitting underground and they'll power a few, a few uh, buildings in Japan, but you never hear about it. It's not sexy, but the amount of, of these energy minerals that are sitting in there are extremely impressive. So if you believe in the electric vehicle movement, you should be, as investors, equally excited, if not more, on the large-scale energy storage. That is the future. It's billions and billions and billions of dollars in markets, and all that stuff is happening underground. Electric vehicles, we talk about because we see them, we drive them, and they're tangible, we want to use them. But the energy storage, all of us could be easily, and think of the applications in third world countries that this can help. And that's where governments right now, we're seeing Australia, Canada, United States, especially Japan, move into those energy storage systems. If I could just add one thing, I, I would, when I look at the lithium market and the, uh, 
potential for growth. I don't simply look at electric vehicles. I certainly, and I'm basically agreeing with what he just said. There's storage, there's electric bikes, uh, you know, buses, certainly buses would be a great thing to have uh, in, a, in, a, in any city. I mean, uh, uh, and, and they are moving that way. So I would look at the whole potential uh, uh, uses of lithium in the future and, and, and battery materials generally and, and think that, that that provides a great opportunity for all of us. Yeah, I would just, uh, just to emphasize that point, uh, the lithium ion battery business is $20 billion a year and is growing at over 20% a year what else is in this economic climate. And that market is still predominantly small devices. Uh, EVs have barely started. Grid storage has barely started. What about the replacement of lead starter batteries? There's all kinds of, those, those are three huge, huge markets. And uh, lithium ion batteries only need a small share of them to continue that 20% uh, growth. So, Again, I don't see, you know, for example, electric vehicles being a revolution. It's an evolution. Gradually, it'll permeate, permeate into society, as will all these other things, and that growth will collectively continue. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to put Christopher on the spot. Christopher, you know all the four of these companies, yes? Do you know all four? No. Which, uh, which of these companies do you know? I know these two. Very Great. Well. I'm going to challenge you to say not something nice about both of these companies. Go. Um, well, Brent was hiding his light under a bushel there when he was talking about the vanadium radox because, of course, he has one of the largest vanadium resources in the world in the form of the Green Giant deposit there in, uh, in Madagascar. Can you reach in closer to the microphone, please, because I'm interested. We want to hear what you're saying. So he's got this gigantic vanadium resource there in Madagascar, which he... Uh, it's keeping for a rainy day. And uh, in Northern Graphite are, are moving towards some um, production as well. You know, it would be one of the first um, North American additions to the production area. Okay, and because you're so scary smart, as we refer to you, can you ask Carlos uh, and Tim a question or two here and then uh, see if you can ascertain something really nice to say about them? Lithium X, you got to know them. I mean, they had that. Yeah, give me something nice to say because I'd love to tell my wife that somebody had something nice to say about me, you know. So, also my children, they're pretty critical. So, I, I've seen I've seen Christopher uh, chug out, you know, thirty pages of research uh, in one day. I think you can handle a couple of uh, questions here uh, with these gentlemen. My mind is a blank. <laughs> um, it's fried. <laughs> If you don't, I'll change it. Okay, fine. Then Carlos, um, do you have any technology patents with neolithium? I'm going to ask you some questions because, you know, usually the panelists that we have here are all investor intel members. Um, but do you have a, a technology uh, patent or two with neolithium? No, we don't. Uh, we, we intend to do simple solar evaporation, which is um, the, um, the most well-known uh, way of doing things in, uh, in the brine sector. So, no, we don't. Well, I can say something nice about your company. We're watching it because I, as an investor, am always watching management who's moving where. I mean, there was a stock that became a client of Investor Intel that I noticed because I found out Adrian had invested in that company. Okay, so, uh, Tim, would you like to, to give us kind of a sell, something nice to say about uh, Lithium X? I mean, I'll be honest with you, we're a little incredulous that the stock can continue to move north. I mean, up a thousand plus percent in one year, as far as we're concerned, that seems like we missed the boat. Tell us why we still have an opportunity to get in now. Well, well again, the, the most important thing is that our goal is to become not just a landowning company, but a production company. So. Again, with, with any luck at all, within a year and a half or so, we will have 2,500 tons of output, and our eventual goal is to get up to 20,000 tons of output of high purity brine. And that will give us really a substantial amount of revenue, which will allow us to get with other partners, maybe go into lithium carbon production. I, I think that the thing that, that I would say that's most important right now is that we have a lot of knowledge. It is not easy, having spent 10 years traipsing, traipsing through the desert in both the Atacama and uh, Clayton Valley, I do know that it's not easy to produce uh, lithium 
uh, with the brine method. It's it, what it really takes is a lot of you could call it artistry, uh, but uh, you need to you need to have the right mixture of brines, and you need to be able to monitor the system as it goes through the stages, so that so that you get out the valuable byproducts at the right stage, that you don't waste them, and that you in the end you end up with a five to six percent brine solution that that has retained as much of the lithium as possible. It's very easy to lose the lithium in the process if you don't if you don't mix uh, the brines properly from the different wells you're using. And the the team we have has had a lot of experience in that. In fact, I mean, it's I would say it's very it's no exaggeration that our our COO um, really developed the Atacama method in Chile, and there was nothing in the desert when he went there. So that's that's the best thing we have going for us. I think expertise. Okay, well, again, we have a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call, brain power on this panel. Does anyone have any questions about battery materials? Processes, extraction, forecast, you got the experts right in front of you. Okay, well, I'll ask one more question. Uh, Christopher, lithium and graphite this year, prices, up or down? You don't have to give me a percentage, and we'll let everyone on the panel. Yeah, I'd say that they're going to be lightly up. Lightly up, both? Lightly up. Yeah, I don't see any reason for a major uplift, but I don't see any reason for them to go down. Well, because, I mean, listening to this panel, I'm super excited about graphite. But Greg's arguments always get me interested in graphite. So, Greg, graphite and lithium, up or down this year? Uh, well, on the graphite price, I've been wrong for a year and a half now, so there's no point changing my uh, changing my opinion now. Um, you know, graphite's kind of been the uh, poor sister among the three minerals because cobalt and lithium have already taken off. Uh, graphite has not yet. I think it will start this year. I think if you remember 2012, the graphite price was way up because of steel demand. Uh, Chinese economy slowed, steel business cratered, graphite price came down, and that has masked what has happened on the battery side where um, batteries have gone from almost nothing to a third of the flake market in five or six years. And so that is going to show up in prices, I hope, this year. And didn't the consultant for Tesla, wasn't he a fan of uh, Northern? Uh, he was. He was. Yes. Uh, he was here last year. I think he's too busy now dealing with Tesla issues. And what about you, Brent? What do you think? Well, um, I, I agree with Greg, uh, and I also agree with Christopher. The prices have actually stabilized. We are seeing now um, requests coming from internally from the traders and some of the people who buy, um, especially the battery side, has, has certainly gone up about 10%, and now you're starting to see the flake for refractories go up about 3 or 4%. One interesting trend that I thought was fascinating when I came back from Japan was that the actual batteries uh, are now using more natural flake graphite than they are synthetic. And that was not the case five years ago. If you go back to 2006, it was 100% synthetic. And now you're seeing about a 52 to 48%. And the actual co composition of a Tesla battery is more natural graphite than it is synthetic. And why is that? Because you get characteristics uh, for both. And natural graphite gives you higher capacity, which is range in, in a car. And the fact that these companies, and there's one in particular in China that's actually experimenting right now with a 90% natural, 10% synthetic battery. So I see that trend being just wonderful for the graphite side. And I'm sure you can talk to Brent a little bit later. He'll explain additional advantages to you. So what do you think, Tim? About uh, pricing, prices. well, I, I, I don't, I don't like to predict pricing short term any any more than I like to predict where the stock is going. But I think it's pretty clear that supply demand near to medium term is is going to be in the favor of the the lithium producers. And I think somebody said it yesterday. There's plenty of sources of lithium, but there are bottlenecks all through the the chain from getting from you know the the raw material source to the uh, to so the eventual you, you don't think we have too much supply I mean there's a lot of people saying no, that no, no. we had a lithium bull market it's over we have you know so you're going and, to negate and, 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 you know long, longer term no I mean I I, uh, I have my own money in the stock a lot of our insiders have a lot of money in the stock and no I I, I, I am you know longer term bullish on lithium and Carlos what do you think 
Um, well, I'm, I'm very bullish. Um, and, and there's, I mean, I guess I think it was somebody yesterday that, that, that explained that the, the lithium pricing is different. Um, everybody tends to look at spot prices in China, which are not the reality in many other places. For example, long-term contracts in, in Chile and Argentina are in, you know, between anywhere between eight and 10 or 11,000. Then you got spodumene almost getting up to 1,000 in Australia, which is also good for us. But um, long term, I, I agree that you know, uh, depending on what happens on the demand side, if all these um, all these car manufacturers do what they're going to do, I mean, price is going to move depending on uh, how much demand for cars are going to be. So in my, in my view, either if there's not enough, the price is going to go to 20 or more. If there's uh, a, a not many cars being produced, then price is going to drop. I mean, I I, I really don't. Um, you know, I have no view in terms of uh, its reality, uh, but my, my own interpretation of where the market is going is that prices will maintain for the next year and change too. There's some, there's some capacity coming on, but uh, after that, we'll see how all these car manufacturers um, you know, um, tend to go out and, and start building these uh, EVs. I, I would second the one point he just made about uh, people in the lithium business who buy steadily, they want they want secure supply of high quality material. And my, certainly my experience at the last company was that uh, our customers uh, were, were willing to pay good money uh, to, uh, uh, to us uh, for a good secure long-term supply. And I would be remiss if I didn't give Adrian a few words here. Adrian, your thoughts. Are you gonna tell everybody what you tell me off the record or are you gonna give us the political answer? Uh, look, I've, I've always been concerned, as you're well aware, about the supply side. Uh, and it's a matter of uh, whether demand can outstrip that supply. But if you have a look at what's happening at the moment, and of course, you, you, you've got Chinese moving outside China now to get the advantage of not having to pay that 37% uh, impost on moving lithium chemicals out. And that's Tianqi building a refinery in Perth. Uh, why are they doing that? It's tax driven, it's so they can sell to Japan. So, but with respect to the supply, if, if the, uh, the spodumene operations expand at the rate that they've got on the books at the moment, there's going to be a glut. It's that simple. Okay. Short term, long term, what are we talking about? Because, you know, as an investor, you know, I, I, I'm more of a short term player. I mean, a year and a half is a long time hold for me. Well, have a look at, have a look at green bushes. We had a bit of a, a discussion on this yesterday. They are building the first expansion, which is a doubling of a mine that is currently pumping 40% of the world's lithium demand into the market, and they're going to double it. And they've already, uh, as I understand it, already got uh, um, stage two under, under design and uh, have uh, asked for expressions of interest on stage three. And if they build all of that, that's 240% of current annual demand. That's a fair bit of lithium. Well, again, I'd like to thank everybody. Thank you, Adrian, for stepping in. I would have had you on the panel if I, uh, if I had had a few more minutes to plan the agenda. So thank you so much for stepping in today.